All right, so good evening and welcome to the third edition of our Terrestrial University. For those of you who don't know it, the Terrestrial University is an experimental lecture series accompanying the exhibition Critical Zones, Observatories for Earthly Politics here at the ZKM in Karlsruhe. The news flash of the week is that we will be able to open the exhibition physically on July 24th. So unfortunately, not with a proper party, but at least in order to welcome small groups of visitors. So do feel cordially invited. Tonight, we have the immense pleasure of having artists Karen Holmberg and Andres Burbano joining us for a discussion with co-curator Martin Guinard. So this is really the immense advantage of having to move everything online. Karen is joining from New York, Andres from Bogota and Martin from Paris. So we are spanning three time zones and are joined by an international audience. So this is really quite remarkable. And um, yeah, so hello to our guests. Let me quickly introduce you, hello, to our audience. Um, Martin, together with Bruno Latour, Peter Weibel, and Bettina Korintenberg, you co-curated the Critical Zones exhibition. And uh, right now, at the moment, you're curating the Taipei Biennale with Bruno Latour, um, which is titled, You and I Don't Live on the Same Planet, New Dipl Diplomatic Encounters. Which is kind of a fantastic title. <laughs> um, Andres, you are a media artist and scholar, currently teaching in the Department of Design at the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia. And you work um, at the intersection of art, science and technology. And just yesterday, actually, I discovered that you did part of your master's here in Karlsruhe at the HFG and ZKM. So um, everything makes so much sense. Um, Right, and uh, number three is Karen with us. Um, <laughs> Karen, you are an archeologist and self-declared volcano fetishist. Um, next to being an incredible writer, you teach environmental science at the Gallatin School of New York University. And your research focuses on radical landscape transformations in the past, present and future in deep time, so to say using volcanism as an example of environmental change. I hope I got everything wrong, uh, right? Not wrong with all of you. <laughs> and um, right, really, we are in for a treat. All together, we will explore the work Topography Time Volcano that is part of the Digital Critical Zone exhibition. And to everybody at home, you are um, very welcome to participate in the conversation uh, by joining the discussion on Telegram. I will try to include your questions into uh, the discussion and uh, we'll just see where the where the discussion takes us. Right, and I'm Barbara, by the way. So uh, yeah, really happy to welcome you. And uh, with this, I think um, Karen, Andres, you can take us away into your wonderful piece and Martin and I will pop in with questions whenever, whenever needed. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having us. Um, Thank you. Uh, I think I'm going to share screen at this point. Um, and I think, Andres, you're, you're fine with popping questions throughout as well. Yes, I am. I am as well. So um, questions can pop as they as they arise um, from Telegram, please. I also want everyone to know and their importance will become increasingly clear throughout the presentation. I would like for you to know, you can see the slides, right? Okay. Um, that on Telegram, we've got Connie Gomez uh, from the Procultura uh, Foundation in Chile, who really is the, the force of nature with all of the good aspects of a volcano who made this project happen, um, as well as Jack Helfrich, who's the sound designer. So Connie was sort of at the very beginning of this project, how it formed. She was the genesis. Jack was the person at the very end who, when everything um, changed for the pandemic, then added sound to these clips when all of a sudden we were going to create something for an online presence when it couldn't physically open. Um, and that transformed the experience. Now it's going to go back in that that picture that you see in the middle is the museum that Connie has had um, the amazing fortitude to have built in Chaitan in Patagonia um that uh, we'll talk about a little bit um in a minute and jack is going to actually read you the sounds that you're going to hear um 
that when Andres plays the clips for use in the museum with Connie's voice in Spanish with anything she wants on there. So um, with that, um, what I'd like to do is just talk you through our project and the scientific side of that. Um, the premise of this project, um, I'm the principal investigator, the PI or lead scientist for a National Geographic funded project that we call transdisciplinary. So it's called the Vilcon Caves and Volcanic Landscape of Chaiten Chile, a transdisciplinary study of coastal Patagonian archaeology and geoheritage. Now the premise of this is that the prehistoric and contemporary use of volcanic landscapes and materials can be unique and strict disciplinary boundaries between earth science and social science data sets and field methods often become necessarily promiscuous in trying to investigate them. So in this project we are embracing the transdisciplinarity that this uh, to consider the long-term intersection of human life with the Chaiten volcano by looking at the events of the past and also at how data from the past is perceived and utilized in the contemporary context. Now, we're lucky to have on the team um, uh, an amazing tephrochronologist, volcanologist, somebody who looks at volcanic materials, Brent Alloway, who is the person who traced 18,000 years of Continuous yet intermittent is the scientific phrase, which I love, uh, eruption. So basically this volcano has been going off all the time. But prior to that 18,000 year mark, um, it's, it's removed by glaciation. So we don't really know what happened then, but it really shouldn't have been a surprise in 2008 when this volcano erupted. And yet it was because Chaiten was not being monitored. You probably saw, even if you don't remember from 2008, pictures of this volcanic lightning. Um, digital photography had just gotten to this sweet spot where the prices had gone down and the quality had gone up in cameras. And we've got some of the most amazing photos of volcanic lightning at that time um, coming out of the Chaitan eruption. Um, it's a, a phenomenon that we have described in written form, at least for 2000 years, Pliny wrote about it. Um, and we hadn't been able to crack it until just the last few years, which is its own amazing volcanological um, phenomena component. So when this volcano erupted in 2008, it was May 2nd, uh, we've just had the anniversary. It was unexpected and it prompted the largest evacuation in Chile's history. Recover from the eruption event is still going on as residents try to resettle the area. So they did get everyone out, um, large loss of life of animals, um, livestock, but people were able to evacuate. Now, many residents who returned after the eruption um, in 2012, people were, were beginning to be able to, to come back after the eruption ended. Um, so it did continue for a number of years. A large number of them lacked electricity or running water, right? Half the town still lacks these basic services. So this project, while it's conservation motivated and scientific data motivated, was also explicitly invited by ProCultura, a heritage organization in Chaiten, to aid them in developing sustainable economic opportunities through tourism. So ProCultura is, I think I, yeah trying to conserve some of these houses that were destroyed, which is a really interesting thing, right? If you think about it, archeologically, at what point do you um, conserve the ruination? Um, and they are running up against that too with funding because it's actually quite expensive to maintain a ruin. So that's a question still um, to be answered. Now, what happened in the process of trying to move the residents of Chai Ten into a new location that would not be in danger of um, the same volcanic hazards that they they that buried their town um, uh, in the in the prior eruption. The government wanted them to move to a different location, which they did fight successfully. They've moved exactly back to the same site, but they found this prehistoric rock art um, cave complex in the process of doing the survey work for um, the new location that was never used. So additionally, the municipality is hoping um, to promote the tourism value of this cave complex, which is called Vilcoon. It's got rock art, it's got 47 designs that are painted in red iron oxide and nine are excised designs or carved. It's got shell middens, so people were bringing in seafood and eating it and just discarding the shells. Um, ceramic, lithic material, faunal remains and some human remains. It is also the site of ongoing um, uh, graffiti and vandalism. And I found out in the course of field work that in fact, and this is actually fairly impressive to me because it's it's 
quite difficult to access the caves. They're along a cliff that's uh, up this muddy slope filled with leeches. And then you have to cross all these algae covered rocks to get to it and along the beach. Um, they're, they're having raves there in, in the evenings because of the acoustic properties. And again, that sense that there is something special that you can just sense when you're inside the earth, right? But scratching their initials. So JB was there as we can see. So there's a, a real need for a collection of the scientific data before it is compromised, but also conservation in the site. So the three primary goals for our fieldwork um, were to document the rock art as well as our excavation pits through photogrammetry. And that's um, something that Andres is going to talk you through a little bit and show you some pretty impressive examples of. So those are photographic sequences to create high definition. And he was able to do three dimensional models of the caves and 360 degree photography. Um, so not only do we get these amazing images of the caves themselves, of the coastline with his drones, but he was able to get what archaeologically is pretty remarkable in that he did photogrammetry of all of our excavation pits. Archaeology is an exceptionally destructive science. Once you dig something, you have destroyed it. So to have that record to be able to look back and say, hey, in my field notes, I don't have the color of that soil lens or where exactly was this rock in relation to this because we, we actually goofed and we didn't write our notes as, as well as we should have. To be able to go back and actually zoom in that way is something kind of mind blowing. So um, he was also using small quadrocopter drones equipped with cameras to create uh, orthophotographic maps of the external portions of the cave sites. So artifacts, good old stones and bones archeology, span um, lots of uh, bone um, that was created uh, or used to create tools, some sort Everyone? of puncturing, hello? Orthogra orthographic maps, maybe you can tell us what it is a bit because it's- Oh, a, it's sorry, a... sorry. Wow. Do you know what? Um, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna give that one to Andres because he's gonna, that's that's his thing. He was the one making them. Andres, do you wanna quickly define sure. an yeah, orthophotographic those are, map? are uh, maps made with a set of images that are taken from above, let's say balloons or drones. And the idea with the drones is that you can program a flight, get like a set of, usually hundreds of images and later on uh, go to software and check like the continuity between each image and create like a really precise uh, geographical map based on photographic information. Cool. And um, if I've said something that's unclear, your questions, please do that again. Um, the bones we were finding, this right here um, is a sea lion jaw, part of the sea lion jaw. They were slaughtering sea lions and bringing them up. Uh, these are sea urchin spines. Um, there were bones from uh, cetaceans. So whether it was dollar, uh, wolf, do, uh, whale or dolphin, we're not sure of. Um, but they're bringing a lot, of, a lot of meat, a lot of seafood into the cave and eating it. We also get small amounts of pumice and obsidian. So we did survey as well. This is a fishing weir that you see, um, a trap for fish on the lower left that we found that was not known prior. Um, this is the very talented Chilean archeologist, Javier Letelier in the middle, who was a force for our field work and remarkable. What you see on she the upper right there. She was pregnant. I know, I wasn't gonna, I was like, do I mention this? So yeah, she, um, she had this news that she had to tell me right before the field work started. She goes, I hope this is okay, but I'm six months pregnant. And I'm like, that's, that's awesome. Because um, there actually was such a need uh, for sort of gender parity in archaeology that there was a hashtag started like pregnant in the field, like as in you can't discriminate against good scientists just because they happen to be female and pregnant. So yeah, she was the hardest field worker of us all. Um, and an absolute superstar. So she was the one who found that fishing weir. Um, upper right is Vilcoon itself. So when we're talking about these caves, we're talking about a complex that is held within that triangular monument that you see on the landscape. So if you can think back, you know, in prehistory, you're in a canoe, you're going up or down the coast of Patagonia, you are going to be able to see that. It is monumental. Um, that is not the volcano, just so you know. That is this natural landmark in the landscape on the coastline. And it's a coastline that's undergone remarkable transformation, huge sea level rise um, with 
with the, the glacial retreat, um, and then these were repeated occurrences of volcanic eruptions. So Javi also found this cave, you're looking at the entrance of it um, on the lower right, um, that does not have any rock art. And what you're doing in this view where we're looking at Vilkun in the, in the upper right, it is standing at the location of the fishing weir and that other cave. So if we're able to go back, we'd like to actually excavate that cave and see what the differences are. Why is one cave marked? Why is the other cave not? What were the different functions or purposes? Did they have any linkage? Maybe they didn't, we don't know. So um, we also looked at what I would consider contemporary archeology, span geoheritage. This is the abandoned um, airport in Chai Ten. It will not be used again. A new airport has been built. What happens to this kind of a site after the event? That's, I think, just as important as looking at the prehistory. And we're also mapping sort of interesting geo heritage, you know, like uh, stratigraphic layers that are very unique and that people should take a look at if they're interested in such things. Um, so we got really good data. Um, doesn't do you any good, does it, unless you kind of share it. One of the things that was important to us to do, not only in um, getting out sort of news articles and then scientific journal articles, but you see Andres there giving a drone workshop to uh, school, school children in Chai Ten. So uh, here we have Connie, that's a video, but I won't show it because it's probably gonna glitch for a lot of people depending on your wavelength or bandwidth. Um, but this is Connie standing at the site of the new museum that literally has been built just now. It's surrounded by these houses that are falling down. It's got a number of different rooms that are purposed for sort of leading you through the experience of the, the scientific interpretation of this area, the experience of the 2008 eruption, and sort of this intersection with the natural world. Um, and she is again on Telegram, so you can you can ask her questions live in real time right now. So this is specifically cited where you see these different volcanoes around. And I know Andres is going to show you some pictures of Lake Corcovado. And here is the museum itself. And here is the team. So um, again, I could I, I could probably give an hour long presentation just on the way that Connie has broken down the rooms for this museum and what their different functions are. But I think with that, I would just say that um, in some of the introduction, our current pro uh, project has this very explicit intention and capacity to improve the scientific understanding of the local area, which has its own merit, but it's additionally valent in the interpretation and the protection of the past landscape as Chai Ten um, is investigating Chai Ten the town. It's the name of the volcano and the town. So as Chai Ten the town investigates ways to harness local heritage sites for sustainable economic development. So there's a, a desire there to create some sort of symbiotic relationship. Um, before I hand you over to Andres um, and before we watch these clips, there are voiceovers in um, each of the four clips that we're going to see. And uh, that is my voice. And that was Andres and Jack okay. and their idea. And I got two, two sets of directions. Andres said, I want you to give us scientific precision with places and dates, but I also wanna hear your inner voice as a human and the relationship between landscape and people. And Jack said, I like narrative story and spoken word style. I really like Maggot Brain. Do you know Maggot Brain? Here's some clips. So I listened to some Maggot Brain. He also sent me Velvet Underground and Good Morning Captain. So um, there, there's a number of different directions that, that kind of all intersected to pass to Andres the football. Perfect. Thank you, Karin. Um, so I think it's a moment to, to play the first fragment of the video. Uh, this project is called uh, Topography Town Volcano. And it's, it consists of four clips of 360 videos that you can go online. And as a drag and move uh, experience, you can experience the 360 um, environment. In, Online, we did like our effort to uh, publish those in um, 8K. So at least in eight, in 4K, you can experience like and see like really sharp detail of the videos. So let's start with the first sequence. 
And then after that, I will um, talk a little bit about it in my perspective and the methods that we, uh, how we acquired the data and uh, why that is meaningful for Karen and me and people in our team. So I'm gonna share screen now. Topography, time, satellite surveillance, unexpected Patagonian explosion. Our concepts of the world and what lies beneath the surface, even now unknown. All coalescing into the global, the round orb and blue marble of the environmental movement, and of that which we see better, the outer of space. Suspended, suspension, tension. Okay, and now I'm gonna share a uh, screen again and show the presentation I have for you about this uh, clip. So this is Pasto, is the place where I was born. And uh, I, it happened to have a active volcano on town. I mean, the entire town was built around the volcano. And since the nineties, it's been very active, but you see on top, like uh, the white is smoke, it's not like a cloud itself. So. This just to tell you that uh, since I was a kid, uh, this was my way to going to school. I had this presence of a big volcano in my mind and the fact that it was active and um, several parts of my education were interrupted with the ideas of doing uh, these kind of emergency evacuation training drills, you know, to stop the classes, go to the a courtyard of the, um, the classroom and stay there, you know, find my professors in order to, to let's say, you know, be prepared in the, in the case of one uh, big eruption. Uh, this is a picture that uh, it, how the volcano used to look like at least once a year. In the winter time, it had like a snow peak. It was really beautiful and um, of the many things that this volcano, this volcano uh, teach me through my life is this thing that, you know, these snow peaks now are very rare. This is not happening any longer. And it's happening in many of the mountains in Colombia and in general in the Andes cause of global warming, right? Like, you know, snow is disappearing. So, this context just to tell you that my relationship with volcanoes is not just like you know an intellectual relationship but also really really a part of my education of, of the person who i am now right but this is not about like let's say volcanoes in colombia it's about uh, uh the andinian mountains in chile of course they are part of the same really long uh chain of mountains the image what we are looking at now is an image that comes from satellites. It's black and white. And the idea of the black and white is that the dark areas are, um, let's say deeper and the bright areas are higher. We acquired this uh, satellite data to model actually the terrain where the, the Chaitén volcano is in Patagonia. We made uh, several tests on how to really properly model this uh, 3D terrain and uh, get really a glimpse of how complex this uh, system was, right? And of course, later on, translate into the uh, 360 videos that you are experiencing online or the installation. Then our task was to model the eruption, right? An eruption usually comes with ashes. Look at this amazing eruption that we are looking now. It's uh, another volcano that is pretty close to the Ch Chaitén volcano that we, uh, are working on in this project. This other volcano is called Cordon Cauje. And the eruption, the eruption was so strong that it created this huge column of smoke. You know, this could be like a part of the uh, things that uh, uh, forensic architecture studied. It was so big, this uh, column of smoke, that 
it went around the planet. You know, we can see now like this uh, data from Canadian uh, scientific sources showing how the ashes spread across the, the globe, you know, and then actually came back to the same place. So this was the metaphor that we used for the modeling this uh, simulation of the volcano, right? That is really uh, working with uh, smoke in a computational uh, way, tweaking the variables and actually creating this uh, simulation of the explosion, right? But more than the explosion, our idea was that the smoke that is coming out of the volcano actually will give shape to the earth, right? And that's kind of the, how this uh, smoke that is going around the planet actually at the end uh, creates the shape of the planet, right? In this uh, way that you are looking at uh, the videos in the 360. And uh, this is very important. I think there's like, a, um, let's say many people at this point is working from a scientific point of view and a philosophical point of view on the image of the planet Earth, how we need to re-elaborate uh, the image. Let's say uh, the work of Frederic Atuati goes in that direction, for instance. Um, another thing uh, that was very- zone as well. Exactly, it's exactly yeah. critical zone. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, CD. And other um, remarkable thing is, you know, going back to historical references uh, from a, you know, media archeology span point of view. And we discover in this amazing book by, by Kircher, the, uh, not only the representation of the, of the volcanoes, you know, exploding in Italy, but already a depiction of the South American continent with this thing that it seems to be something like a volcano of water, right? He's is representing in South America, like the counterpart of the volcanoes, you know, like the terrestrial forces that are like fire, you know, and here he goes into water. So he proposes this uh, kind of volcano avis that is like in the middle of South America between Peru and Chile, actually, that is an amazing reservoir of water and actually gives birth to many of the rivers there, including the Amazon River. So that's um, just mind blowing to find this image. And this is one of the most important reasons why we choose um, to include the, uh, you know, images of this, um, masterpiece from uh, Athanasius Kircher in our project uh, or in this first uh, fragment. So I'm gonna stop um, sharing screen now and eventually uh, invite Karen to add a couple of things about it before we check the second next video or Mari. No, I think you're done good. Let's keep going. I used to be a VJ. Can you so confirm like, it's it's Durer, it's Durer who drew the map that you just shown us shown us. No, it's Kirchner. Kirchner. Kirchner the map. It's Kirchner. It's Kirchner. Yeah, that's why Kirchner. I was confused. Yes. I, 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 I was, I know it looks like. Yes, sorry. Yeah, from from Mundo Subterraneus. Yeah, like the same book that yeah, uh, represents the explosion of the Vesuvius in Italy, and it was kind of like uh, this life changing experience for him. So also includes this, and it's part of this research I do. Uh, I'm uh, trying to understand, because um, Kircher never came to America, but he got like a lot of Jesuits who sent him information. And uh, in many books, uh, there are like images and depictions of, you know, American maps or, or situations. So that's what I'm trying to, to explore. I, think, I guess I would add one thing, which is simply the name of this clip is outside, so outside of the critical zone, and it's the eruption, so outside eruption. Um, but it's it's uh, meant to sort of convey this this part of the, the global ring of fire and the, the enormity of the planet, the global impacts that do happen, but then the impact on this one local town is what we're going to be able to narrow down in on. Maybe can I add one question from Telegram because I thought that that uh, might add uh, a little nuance uh, to your descriptions. Uh, it was Meso Yala who asked, are there some smells too, say in the town with the volcano in the background? Um, and she says, uh, I'm trying to experience it in my mind. So I thought maybe it, it could be interesting because we've got the audio and we've got the visual. Um, maybe what, what are the smells? 
but the the sensory perception overall of of volcanism is is actually something that I wrote a book chapter about too. Like there's this whole phenomenological thing of it. Like you 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 smell the sulfur, you smell burning material, especially burning organic material. You hear like incredible noises, you hear these incredible vibrations. But um, at this point, because the eruption was in 2008, unless the, the you walk into the crater of Chaitan and it degasses, you're not actually smelling anything other than, than the town of Chaitan itself, which can smell like cows or grass or the seawater. Andres, what smells do you remember? Yeah, sulfur, that's uh, very strong usually. And it's like a contrast between the beauty of the scene and like how uh, strong the sulfur uh, smell is. And uh, Kircher also talks about it, you know, like, because uh, it was like a synonym of, you know, hell or devilish, uh, you know, uh, apparition or something like that. So. That's an interesting aspect to have a smell that is already documented in such an old, you know, uh, document. That's uh, and actually, Constanza said on um, on Telegram. She said, "I don't know how it is for Andres Town, but in Chaiten, you can smell a soft smell of ash." So also, so and it's true, yeah. yeah it's, which is almost, I think, Connie, you're right, but it's almost more of a feel in the nose as much as it is a smell. It's like one of those strange synesthesias. Cool. These are, it's fun getting the questions in the middle. I like yeah, there's, it. Yes, sorry, there's another one, uh, but then I, I, I'll let you carry on. Um, it was just, you mentioned uh, the smells and the phenomenology being close to volcanoes, a, a book that you mentioned. I, I missed it as well. Um, can, you, can you? Oh, no, I was saying I'd written, a, I'd written a book chapter. It was just an edited volume and I had to pull it up because I couldn't remember the name of my own title, but I called it The Sound of Sulfur and Smell of Lightning, Sensing the Volcano. <laughs> and that was uh, in 2013, making sense senses of the past towards a sensory archaeology. So people are thinking of these things. That was edited by Joe Day, who is fantastic in Dublin. Thank you. Very cool. Andres, take us to number two. Perfect. Let's go back to three sixty video. Emergency, destruction, aftermath, calm. Enormity within the landscape, even if small from the exosphere's eye. Topography after the event, a different place. Natural pyramid in the distance, beacon. The cycle of waves, never starting. Never ending. Okay, welcome to Patagonia now, right? So let me use my presentation and I will talk a little bit about uh, Um, are you watching the presentation now? You are, right? No, uh, no, not yet. We we'll no. see the, the video. You might have to change or undo the screen sharing again and start that over. Okay, so here it is. Okay, yes. yeah, so now we are in Patagonia. Right, I uh, months before I received this email by Karin through a good friend, and um, 
she might me to be part of this amazing uh, expedition uh, financed by National Geographic. And uh, for me, it was a, a mystery kind of the landscape and uh, the places that we will uh, visit in that uh, place. Uh, I'm showing you some of the images, you know, of this amazing intertwine of the one of the strongest terrestrial forces that is like the creation, you know, the emergence of the mountains of the Indian mountain change that goes from Patagonia, from Chile, Argentina, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, and even goes underneath the, the Atlantic Ocean, crosses the entire continent, right? And intertwined with the Pacific, right? Like this, amazing forces like combined, you know, like you see like the ocean and then also very close up uh, snow peaks. This for instance is the Corbucobato volcano. It's one volcano that you can see from Chaiten. Uh, and people knew for instance that this was a volcano, but of course the very strange thing of Chaiten is that people didn't know that it was actually a volcano, right? So it was like a more, you know, another mountain there and actually had like a very stronger option in 2008. This, for instance, this image uh, shows kind of the, the uh, river path where the many of the remains, you know, and the, of the landslide and the lahar that came from the explosion from the volcano to the Chaiten town. It's full of wonders. It's a place full of wonders. For instance, this one, these trees are the Alerces, are like the, the sisters of the redwoods, let's say in California, the super tall uh, trees. These are the tall trees in, uh, in the south. Incredibly beautiful. And just to mention one of the amazing things that I discovered around this sector is that, uh, you know, a couple of hours north from Chaiten, there is this place called Monte Verde. It looks like very simple here, but it's one of the most important archeological sites in the Americas. Why is that? Because a couple of decades, decades back, some American archeologists working with a Chilean archeologist found some remains that were really old. And when they went to date this, it went back to 15, at least 15,000 years back. These findings request to tell again the story of how humans populated the Americas, right? That eventually is not eventually just one path to the north, the Bering, but eventually, you know, like canoes moving and actually the Pacific Ocean, the, the waters are like kind of somehow the facilitator of such transaction, which is, you know, like, okay, I'm thinking about the planet in a different way. And here I am. To try, you know, uh, calibrating my drone. And that little dot, red dot that you can see there is current. And why I'm here, right? Why I'm here? I'm here because media artists usually are trained to believe that the computer laugh is very important. The media laugh is very important. But I think media artists need to know also to learn a lot from field work, not just processing the data in computers, but also going to acquire the data in the field. And we need to learn from uh, people, you know, who are experts, volcanologists, archeologists, anthropologists, biologists, who are uh, really masters of the, of the interaction with the, you know, with nature and actually creating the, transforming the landscape into, into a, a scenario of knowledge. And Karen does, just that in an amazing way, in like in many levels. So these again are some of the remains of the explosion that you know, two years ago, still were there of one explosion that happened in 2008, just to understand how strong it was. This is how nature, how beautiful nature is there, you know, like a, this, this forest, but also, you know, a little bit of the beach. The beach and the beautiful Pacific Ocean, the Vilcun cave, you know, um, hill and the, where the caves, you know, where the cave paintings are, 
I just want to put a disclaimer that those are not our tire tracks. I was very grumpy that somebody took four by fours on that beach. <laughs> That's true. And, um, and then, you know, like my, my mission in, in this negotiation between the field work is uh, acquiring enough data that it's actually very consistent, like a model, and then to process that back in the lab to make sense, to create like a meaningful uh, audiovisual piece, like these three-dimensional videos that we're checking in the exhibition and also as part of the, of the real exhibition. This is quite um, moving, let's say, uh, you know, the, 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 the mountains of the Andes are the mountains where I was born. The, the waters of the Pacific are the waters that I went first, you know, for a swim. And now this mix is, is showing me like this new path of, of knowledge and, uh, and uh, transformation in, in many ways. So, uh, and that's the, the door that Karen opened and the team in general opened to me in this uh, trip. And that's uh, all I can have I to say. I jump in for a small sure. remark because of, I mean, it's, it's just very interesting when you talk about the, the, your role as an artist going to the field, going to the kind of, of, of the field work. And of course, that's one of the big themes of the exhibition, knowing that critical zones, of course, are sciences which are field-based they're pretty much you know, a bunch of scientists who need to collect data from the field because the modeling you know, of the earth, uh, let's say the kind of macro modeling is not precise enough for what they try to, to, to look at. But then there's also all the analysis that they're doing into the data uh, within their lab. You know, there's always this kind of dual moment between the, they, they spend the three months planning one expedition to go to an observatory as an interdisciplinary team and, and I, I'm just here like making a small teaser for the show, the, the uh, installation by, by, uh, which is made by uh, Sohel and uh, Alex Bra Aren. The show is very much based onto that kind of interaction of like the luck that they had to be able to jump in several of those expeditions on the field. So it's just like, it's a very interesting relationship to science, you know, not a lab based science, not just a, a field work based science either, but really a back and forth between the yeah. two. And, and it's really beautiful that you're re-articulating it in your show, in your piece as well. Like, I'm very glad to see that that's, there's an ethos which really crosses um, from, from their piece to, to yours, and, and it's an important one. Thank you. Yeah, field work and interaction with other uh, practices is very important to me, and I think it's a very fertile ground to build uh, upon. Of. Karen, would you like to add something or should we? No, uh, I, think you're, I think you're doing awesome and we should just dive into the cave. Let's go to, I used to be VJ, So like, you know, putting videos and jumping back and forth, <laughs> that's part of my, <laughs> my nature. So let's keep moving. Next so track. now we are gonna check the cave. Let's go inside the cave. the deeply internally earthly. Technological, but not cold data set. A point cloud and magical inner world like that of glowworms and blue-green bioluminescence. Millennia of human experience and thought and art. Scratched initials, JB. Were you giving to or taking from the past?
Okay, so this was the cave um, in Morro Bilkun in Chaiten. And here uh, there's like a bunch of important things uh, to me, let's say. The first thing is that, uh, let's say my task, my main task was to go and do like uh, the as precise as possible registration of the uh, caves uh, with photogrammetry techniques, right? Like taking many pictures and then combining the pictures to create uh, first a point cloud and then like a really three-dimensional model that uh, accurately describes what is there. But arcades, right? So the challenges are many, like it's very dark. We needed to pro you know, design a proper lightning conditions for it. Uh, uh, linings that eventually won't, won't destroy the, the pigments that have been there for, um, for thousands of years probably, or, or more than that. And, um, and then, you know, take the data to the lab, you know, like a, the transforming this territory that was there into a digital territory and bring to the lab to then the process and post-process to get like a accurate representations and um, um, precise models. So we are now in the field of point clouds. We see these point clouds like this way, but we cannot forget that these are these things computationally, right? Like lists of every single uh, element that is there, right? Like thousands, each point cloud, let's say describe one surface, one cave in this case, one point has at least RGB, red, green, blue, black values and X, Y, C. But you know, thousands, sometimes millions of points that describe one space that locally, because they are, you know, tables uh, at the computational level, it is possible to process them quite accurately you know, with a pre precise software. Here, I need to give uh, credits for the processing of this um, data from the cave to my colleague, uh, Pierre Puentes, who is uh, my young collaborator in this project. He's just 21 years old. And uh, we've been working in this uh, translation, you know, of the data that we got in the cave into the computational uh, level in the most um, accurate way, but also looking to produce the four videos that are part of the installation, right? Not just like the 360 videos what we saw, but also the videos of the installation that will be open July 26. Barbara, is that the day? So now you got me when I was reading Telegram. I'm sorry. What happened? What did you so do? Sorry. The opening is going to be July 26. 24th. Sorry. 24th. 24th. Okay. Yeah. So these are some uh, parts of the process, of the computational process. Uh, remember we, after taking the pictures, we get like in this world of the uh, data points, then we can see still the digital markers there that we later on remove. Uh, and we get like this shape of the cave, uh, you know, that shows like the, 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 the complex nature at the tectonic level of this territory. Um, and then uh, we were able, you know, with the photo, photo uh, quality of each small part to create like the accurate representations of the paintings themselves, which is really remarkable, right? Like this thing, you know, using technologies from the present to actually document uh, ways of creating images from the ancient past. And that speaks about like many things. I'm gonna show you some of the first examples of uh, photogrammetry that we did, like as how like I sent this to, to Karen and she said, okay, this is, um, this looks good, let's keep working. And it's, you know, the evolution of that dialogue is this installation that we are showing. This is the, uh, the view from the inside to the outside. You can see like a little bit of light outside there. And this looks like a picture, but it's actually a computational reconstruction, right? There is no way to take one picture like that from the inside of the cave, right? Like it's, it's simply impossible. And this is very important to me in, in many ways. Uh, I just mentioned one of them, like a couple of months after we finished uh, this uh, field work and I started to uh, 
work in the photogrammetry techniques to reconstruct the cave and so on. I was in charge of putting together one exhibition in Canada, in, in also the Pacific in Vancouver, uh, as part of the Seagraph uh, conference. And the topic of that uh, con the, um, exhibition was the intersection between indigenous communities and new technologies, especially in Canada. For instance, this is a reinterpretation re of one transformation mask from uh, British Columbia with, uh, you know, like robotics uh, and a HoloLens inside, you know, like also pointing to this problem of the immersion, right? Why uh, these places that are immersive, like the caves are also places where people feel committed to give and leave a visual trace, a visual imprint. This also talks, and this is the last thing, about the ephemerality of our digital culture, right? We are looking now to paintings that have been there for thousands of years, analogs, you know, before industrial painting was possible. And uh, in ZKM, you know very well these problems. At this point, we are struggling to read digital files from 20 years ago, right? So that ephemerality of the uh, digital world is also visible when you confront the digital world that we have now and these ancient visual um, expressions. And that's all that I have about this uh, fragment. So maybe just to let you know what happened on Telegram uh, when I got a little distracted because it was a it's an interesting discussion that is going on there um, because uh, Juan Pablo asked um, he said I'm wondering if there was also research done with the local communities that inhabit uh, Chaiten and their particular relationships and stories around the eruption especially taking in, uh, into account the political implications of a national geographic framed narrative. So I thought that was quite an interesting um, uh, question. And then Connie answered um, that, yes, indeed, the first and most important reason why we have been working on getting up the museum was to help Chaiten's people re-signify the experience they went through. It was one pretty disruptive event. They were all evacuated by the authorities. They left their home for what they thought was going to be two or three days. And it took them three years to be able to get back home. So that's why we started the museum. And I thought that's just this incredible background story also. And it's uh, it's great that this is, so this is all happening on Telegram as we speak. Thought I'd quickly feed it back into you. <laughs> strong, it's strong, it's strong, it's strong. There's something very beautiful that you talk about, which is this uh, morality of the images i mean it's a great opening especially if we think that you know like one magnetic storm of some sort would literally wipe out that cloud yeah, so i think that there is something you know which really kind of uh, in a way your work would be a sort of allegory of that of the, you know like a cloud coming from within the earth <laughs> and 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 uh, you know like yourself you're working about like another cloud which is itself situated within uh, uh, the earth with all those, you know, like uh, um, with all those uh, those data sets which are relying on, ser on servers which are themselves like inside of the earth, but which are just as fragile, like much more fragile than we think they would be. And so that I think that totally. that's, that's yeah. actually that that I didn't think of your work this way, but that creates a very beautiful sort of uh, of uh, of allegory of uh, a sort of digital condition. This, this, this idea of like the the especially with the first image where you recreate the globe out of smoke, you know, there's a smoke yeah. screen and the, the globe appears that there's something very interesting in, in this relationship to the, to the cloud. And I'm, I'm wondering, because we, we had the luck of, of seeing that you were very generous with this presentation on, on how you were, you, were, um, I'm, I'm, you were very generous on the presentation in, in explaining how your collaboration started. But really, like, could you, could you, Maybe explain to us, Karen. Like, at which point do you feel that you needed to work with Andres on that on that project? Like, that would be very interesting for me to to know. Because yeah, we um, got the journey, and we don't really get the. Yeah, it was actually it was a blind date. Um, I have a, a dear friend, uh, Felipe Gaitanaman, who's an archaeologist who 
went through the PhD process with me at Columbia University in New York, um, and he is now um, back in Bogota, where he is from. And as I was putting together this project and we were having some WhatsApps, he's like, you know what? You really should include this guy who's doing this amazing stuff on a, so it was a colonial church graveyard or something. Andres, what was it that you did for him? Yeah, it was, uh, um, we did 3D scanning of remains of people who were uh, buried inside a church, a colonial church as early as 1608. Yeah. And um, then when I got in touch with Andres, uh, it turns out that he'd already done work in the Mayan area with, with dear friends of mine who I've known for many, many years. So with that kind of, of triangulation, um, you know, he showed up in the field and we met for the first time there in Patagonia. And he showed up with like geared up to his teeth. He brought so much more equipment than, you know, he was, you know, tasked with bringing. He got, he took it upon himself to get licenses. You got a free license, like something that would have been incredibly expensive. Like somehow he sweet talked the, 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 the software company into giving him a license. And then he did such an amazing job. He's got one for life for the life of the company, which is the same thing maybe, but. Um, X4D. Yeah, X4D, X4D. They were, they Swiss were incredible. company. Right yeah. Now. Yep. Um, and I effectively said this, hey, feel free to do what you want. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to box you in and assign you what you need to do. As long as you can give us a really good 3D scan of the cave, anything else that you want to do is gravy. And he went to town. And that was, that was I think, the, the smartest thing I could have done other than putting him on the team sight unseen was just saying, just go play because he took that ball and he really rolled with it. And what that meant was it, it took, it took the work in a different way. And he, it's, it's not just that he was sort of parasiting off of the science that was happening. He, he changed the science as he was going. And there was another artist who came with us as well, Caitlin Berrigan, who was filming clips for okay. something that she calls imaginary explosions, where it's an episodic film series where a trans feminist network of volcanologists conspire to set off the world's volcanoes simultaneously to destroy the patriarchy, colonialism, and capitalism. So she was filming clips yes. in little spare moments when she wasn't needed to empty buckets or Andres didn't need her help with lighting. And because those two were there and very tech savvy and very lighting savvy, we got much better images for our scientific work than we would have had. I wouldn't have shown up with all of the LED lights that Andres put on my shopping list to bring down. And I have to say, without those LED lights, we wouldn't have the images that we've got um, that are really helpful as documents because we're we're also trying to make sure that we're we're creating an archive of what these these images are like now because there isn't enough conservation in place yet, which Connie can can speak to that on telegram just the frustration of how do we how do we protect these caves or but but not you know wall them off um type of a thing so not what the word i missed the word like protect not, them not but... not like wall them off like not wall them off wall them yeah off. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah like how, how do you how do you allow uh, allow people access to the heritage of their area but protect it as well it's not like you know a, it's it's just this yeah how do you how do you go about that the right way i guess it, it, that's actually a really fascinating question which uh, touches to this to this notion of heritage and legacy and, and actually I'm, I'm very curious to know uh what, what's your point on it like how do you think what do you think is an interest a proper I, I, approach for that yeah no it's especially when it's, you mentioned that archaeology was an extraordinarily i quote you extraordinarily destructive <laughs> practice which is well, it is. the stratigraphy is gone yeah. yeah 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 so you have to make sure that you you know try to try to you can't even say do no harm do as little harm as possible like the pits that we excavated were um one meter by 0.5 meters deep and they often went down two meters deep because we were desperately not wanting to um, destroy, uh, you know, the, the caves, uh, you know, take, go in as narrow a space as we could. I mean, if you can imagine being in a cave itself already is going to be a little bit claustrophobic once you're two meters down in that kind of a narrow chasm, but it was, it was worth it to try to just be as, as I guess, respectful as possible. And that's, that's the difficulty too, of how, 
how do you do honor and give respect to this space that is, it's important and it, it shouldn't be walled off in any kind of elitist way. And yet if, if, it's, if it's being covered in graffiti and the, the, it's being destroyed and dishonored, how do you protect that? So that's, that's what Connie lives with I think, day in and day out, trying to figure out those issues. And especially if you're trying to attract people to this, this very remote area saying, hey, we have something unique here. These caves are really special. You're actually inviting people in specifically for the caves. At what line do you kind of do this? And that's that was one of the things too we were thinking about originally with doing this kind of imagery. If if she can have something that particularly like if you have a if you're in a wheelchair, you're, you're not going to make it up to these caves. It's it's pretty arduous to get there. It's 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 a challenge. How is it that you can share that with people who wouldn't be able to go? To the actual cave and and how successful is immersive technology or not successful do you get that phenomenology or phenomenological experience of being there with the imagery or are you getting something else is it just a simulacrum um, um yeah. martin i just uh, realized that we are in the last five minutes uh of this oh. conversation which is terrible because there's still so much to say and ask but maybe, um, Martin, would you like to add uh, one last question that we could discuss and then find some way to close this off? Yeah. We didn't even go to Mars. We didn't oh, do we the didn't final, we didn't even go to Mars. Right, maybe we should, do we, can we yes. indulge people to stay with us for five more minutes? Is that allowed? I don't know, I think so. Of course, of course. Of co curator says so. Let's go to Mars. Yay! Okay. So, <laughs> let's go to Mars. Also, also just take localize authority Mars. from Paris. <laughs> <laughs> so here it goes to Mars and beyond. So we are going beyond the critical zone. Yeah. alternate world where volcanoes and ice, that which in danger and is endangered on Earth, will protect us. Not this Mons, Alba Mons, so large, so far. Viking, a project that took years of human life that gave us a new red world of pictures. 3D printed ice by robots to shelter creatures not meant to be anywhere other than the Earth. There is both magic and displacement to the creativity to conceive such an idea. Can we not use it on Earth? Down below, deep down from there. Here. And I know, we're, I know we're almost out of time, so I, I just want to interject because it's it's rather significant, at least to me, um, where that blind research date that Andres and I went on um, in Chaitan, not only did that work out really well in terms of the intersection and the art and the science creating something new, but um, the Mars connection for me, whereas Andres has this sort of intimate connection to the volcano through where he grew up, um, for me, at least you can share screen. Um, I feel something similar to Mars. It's not only that it has the largest um, volcano in the solar system. It's also, um, it's my father was one of the first aerospace engineers um, hired by NASA and he did the Viking 
um, orbiter that gave the, the images of Mars. But he also, in terms of critical zone and thinking about the Earth you know, from a distance, um, he did the lunar orbiters, the five lunar orbiters that mapped 99% of the moon. And this is the that first image of Earth before that iconic um, blue marble one from the Apollo. You had the lunar orbiter image in 1966. And this hung over our, our stairway because all the, the, the engineers and scientists on the team got this image sort of in, in my childhood home. So it was a very lived kind of a visceral thing. And this is a, a historic picture um, where the, um, the arm uh, of this orbiter is, is being used to cut um, the, for the Viking, it used to cut the ribbon at the Smithsonian um, Air and Space Museum uh, after getting a, a connection to the to the Viking from a signal. This this arm, its last name is actually Holmberg by my last name because my father had to take it on the airplane um, the, the night before the ceremony uh, in its own seat because it, it couldn't be shipped otherwise. Um, so uh, this whole like kind of conception of of how is it that we look at the planetary and how is it that we know more about the surface of the moon or the surface of Mars than we actually know about what's underneath the earth because we don't, we cannot image that. We can only create these ideas, which is what Kierker was doing, which is I think why Idris and I have such a love for that. But that's also what um, Alexandra Aren and, and Frederica Tuati are doing with Terraforma with the sort of this Gaia, um, Gaia, Gaiography? Gaia graphy, yeah. Gaia graphy. Yeah, <laughs> Axel Grégoire, Axel Grégoire as well. And Excel, and Excel, sorry, Excel, yes. <laughs> Three A. <laughs> a beautiful book. It was to Alexandra, and uh, yeah, beautiful book. So that's all I. I didn't want to, to interrupt you though, because it was just incredible. That it, I mean, it's it's absolutely wonderful to hear you after this clip, which goes out the way in which you want to reground you, uh, you know, where, literally where you want to land, which, which is this metaphor that Bruno uses all the time. But it's uh, it's I know that that's a discussion that we had a couple uh, a couple months ago already on like this this very interesting generational shift between your father, which you know was working at the time when we could expand. And now this time where, okay, so there's still this phantasma to expand, but there's also the, the real constraint of finding ways to live down on earth. And, and I think that it's, again, it's an intuition, which is very important. It's like, we, we know quite a lot about the cosmos as a whole, when we think about the size of it, you know, like as Bible we showed to us, we know at which rate it expand by playing the Adam Race video on the, on the, the, the opening date. We don't know that much about the very space in which we live, the kind of dependencies it, it is, the, the kind of you know envelope in which we are. And of course, it seems to be big, but it's, it's still like ev everything that at least matters to me <laughs> happens in this one kilometer. Yeah, and exactly. So I think that it's a, it's a very beautiful way to, to land both this kind of, uh, not only what you do in your film, which is this, uh, this um, you know, like this shift not only of perspectives, but also of scales. And, and, and before we go down and, and, and also, you know, like this, this kind of way that that's very generous of you to like remind us that for you, it corresponds to a kind of generational, generational shift as well. Like uh, uh, sort of like uh, this connects to a, a certain kind of histories, like how, you know, this kind of conquest of space you know, uh, turns into uh, looking into ways of dwelling onto our own planet. You know? And, that's, and that's I forgot to tie up that story, which was that, um, yeah, this actually entails you as well and Bruno. You and Bruno uh, pushed me to do uh, an oral history with my father and to record those oral histories. And Andres actually has um, quite a significant background of research in aerospace history, um, particularly in Latin America and, and um, all of his technological savvy. So he's been helping me with that video and all of that, that oral history. But particularly for me, what's, what's fascinating about, about my own father's one you know, human lifespan trajectory and career trajectory is the very first project that he was hired to, uh, to work on for NASA entailed trying to, to measure the radiation in the Van Allen belt because the very year that we discovered it, we exploded nuclear weapons in it just to see what would happen. The, the natural phenomena was so strong and so resilient that we could 
We could do anything we wanted to it without worrying, but we then needed to find out how much additional radiation might be up there before the astronauts had to, had to go through it, right? So then you go through all of the Cold War and all of these different projects after that um, with the Viking, with the, the, the orbiters. What was his final project? It was working with the ozone layer, HALO, halogen occultation experiment, which to have gone from that one feeling of, oh, cool, the Van Allen belt, that's interesting. Let's blow something up in it to, oh my God, did we use too much hairspray? We need to be a lot more careful. That kind of, that perception of nature and its fragility or its response to the to human action is radically transformed just within that 40 years. So that's, I think, confronting. Yes. I, I think that this is also a kind of a nice way to land um, with our terrestrial <laughs> university of today because unfortunately we we have run up run out of time but we did we did the entire circle right and and we've uh, you've gone down down below and up up and beyond and uh, the up up and beyond has brought us back into the critical zone so thank you so much um andres karen and martin for this uh, voyage and yeah, and, and Connie and Jack. Exactly. Thank yeah. you so and much, Pierre, Pierre, for and, 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 and Pierre. Also, yeah, and uh, and 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 also uh, Peter from the video studio, who is uh, doing the, who is hosting us tonight. So thank you so much, and everybody. To everyone on Telegram. Yes, everyone on Telegram. The discussion has been insane. As again, I I, I couldn't follow anymore, but it was really. I'm gonna read up. Uh, on what happened there, because that was kind of a, a very interesting parallel discussion. So thank you um, to everybody. And um, yeah, so this is the end of our third uh, terrestrial university. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, and uh, Andres um, also mentioned it as well, the exhibition is physically opening uh, its doors on July 24th. But until then, you can discover the Critical Zone exhibition online. Um, so don't miss out on that, where you can also uh, see uh, Karen and Andres' work again and uh, take more time to, to deep dive into it. And also, until the 24th, you can follow our digital program. You'll find the entire information on our website. We have um, online guided tours every week. We've got uh, Instagram Lives every Wednesday on Instagram, obviously. Um, and we have the Terrestrial University uh, on this live stream every Thursday evening at 7 p.m. Uh, next week, we will have a very special guest, probably. So um, stay tuned and check out uh, check out our website. And uh, yeah, with this, I think we can all wish you a good night or a good afternoon or a good morning, depending on where you are. Thank you so much to everybody. Bye. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Martin. Very Thank nice you, to Barbara. meet you. Thank, Thank you, Martin. Thank, Thank you, Andres. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much.